Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan, and today we're going to continue our Everything Wrong Battle Tactics Analysis series by dipping beneath the waves and looking at the final battle in Aquaman. God, that intro pumps me off. I really want to ride a swordfish full speed into a whale and, like, impale it now. It also makes me hungry for swordfish. Anyway, DC made an interesting turnaround with one of their cinematic entries last year, Aquaman. After years of trying to compete with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they've adopted the if you can't beat them, join them mentality. Gone are the desaturated serious narratives, gone are the de-mustache serious characters. And that's not exactly a terrible thing. I really like what Thor. He's a whole lot more likable than the weird Kryptonian and the guy with PTSD who runs around screaming Rachel all the time. Aquaman is also quite familiar. He has a mother trapped in an unreachable quantum realm-like prison, a brother who wants to kill him for the throne. He's also lovably detached from the seriousness of the situation he faces, and the palette of violets and neons in the film would make James Gunn proud. And in case you're wondering, no, I don't think Aquaman is ripping off a Marvel movie. I actually really enjoyed Aquaman, and I think it borrowed a lot of good techniques from Marvel. And more importantly, DC finally understands that it's making a superhero movie, and they shouldn't be taking themselves too seriously. It's really up to YouTubers like me to take it way too seriously and ruin what clearly is supposed to be a fictional battle by doing a very in-depth battle analysis, which is what we're going to do today. We're going to be looking at one of my favorite scenes from Aquaman, the extremely epic Battle of the Brine. Anyway, let's first break down the different factions involved in this battle. First up, the Atlantean Empire. The average Atlantean looks quite similar to a human being, but their internal anatomy has evolved for aquatic environments. They have respiratory systems that allow them to extract oxygen from the water, and their bodies are able to withstand incredible depths of at least 20,000 feet below the sea level. Which is actually really crazy if you think about it, because at that level, there's about 8,900 pounds of pressure per square inch. The world record lowest dive by a human is around 1,000 feet, and that definitely was not a normal thing to do. So either the Lanteans are incredibly durable, or more likely, they don't have any air bubbles inside of them, like we do. Still, the average Atlantean is stronger and faster than the average human, judging by how effortlessly they can move through the water. But only the highborn Atlanteans were truly superhuman. They were not only incredibly durable and strong, but could also breathe on the surface and underwater. Some also had the ability to communicate with aquatic animals telepathically, and others could bend and shape water molecules with their mind. Atlantean society at one time had been the most advanced on the planet. While humanity was still living in mud huts, the Atlanteans had invented a source of unlimited energy. But ultimately, their pursuit of the sciences created a great disaster which sunk their city below the waves. The Lanteans would then go on to break up into seven different factions. That's, that's not seven. Seven different factions. Including the Atlantean civilization that evolved in the ruins of Atlantis. Despite losing their connection to the surface, they still had some pretty advanced weapons and war machines available. The Atlantean Man of War used hydro pulse rifles, which turned water into energy rounds using a small fusion reactor. The bolts were incredibly powerful and could easily burn through an unarmored organic being. The Atlantean Man of War was also equipped with plasma charged energy swords. In order to increase their mobility and firepower, the Atlanteans also had an assortment of warships and rode animals into battle, mainly sharks, including prehistoric ancestors of modern day sharks. The Zebelian were closely related to the Atlanteans and were the only other kingdom that didn't lose their human like form. Their physiology was pretty much the same as the Atlanteans, although their royal family was red headed, which probably means that they're a lot of fun to be around at a party and are more prone to getting burnt in the sun. While the Atlanteans rode sharks into battle, the Zeblian soldiers usually rode giant monster seahorses. Which is why we get this awesome picture here of Dolph Lundgren riding a giant seahorse. 
magical. The Zibelians also used energy rifles, but they had orange rounds instead of blue rounds. Then there was the kingdom of the fishermen. They had long lost their humanity and legs and developed into weird human-fish hybrids. Their society was considered more enlightened and they focused on the arts and philosophy. The Fisherman King believed that when the Atlantean Kingdom finally reveals itself to humanity, it should be to teach them how to code and not to eradicate them. The Fish King was a nice guy and ultimately the Atlantean King Orm saw that as a weakness and gutted him like a fish. King. Fish King. With these three kingdoms united, Orm marched on the fourth kingdom of Atlantis, the Brine. Like the fishermen, the Brine had also lost their human-like form and evolved to be crab-like in nature. The Brine soldiers were quite large and four-legged and were encaged in natural armor. Most of their forces walked along the sea force and were melee fighters, but they did have some ranged weapons including heavy artillery, which launched molten magma projectiles from cracks in the Earth's crust. They also had some limited flying vessels, or at least swimming vessels that weren't walking on the ground. Lastly, we have the terrifying kingdom of the Trench located in the deepest part of the ocean. The Trench were amongst the most physically terrifying and strong former Atlanteans. Adopting the appearance of an angler fish, the Trench lived at depths that made even the Atlanteans uncomfortable. Living in the depths in complete darkness, they no longer relied on sight to navigate, but for some reason they could still breathe air on the surface. They had incredibly sharp teeth and claws and attacked in huge swarms, making them a very formidable enemy. And the wielder of the Atlan Trident could control them. They also had a weakness to strong light, but it does seem like Atlan's Trident could mitigate that weakness. So back to the battle, Orm marches with the three kingdoms of Atlantis against the Brine in what's sure to be an incredibly brutal and costly battle for both sides. Although the Atlanteans, Zeblians, and fishermen are far more advanced than the Brine, the Brine are an incredibly durable and tough and very proud and warlike species. The Atlanteans, with their numerous warships and fast-moving animal mounts, have not only a mobility advantage but also a vertical advantage. The Crustacean Army of the Brine are mainly geared for short-range melee battles on the sea floor because the Brine are basically sea dwarves. But Orm marches straight into them in a constantly melee fight, which is really stupid. Never do a frontal assault against dwarves. Although the Atlanteans are armed with melee weapons, the average Atlantean soldier is much smaller than the Brine Crab Warrior. Also, Atlanteans have energy rifles, which look like they are able to pierce through the Brine's crustacean armor and do a lot of damage. The best strategy for the Atlanteans would actually be to stay at range and then bombard the crustaceans on the sea floor. The only real range weapon that posed a big threat to the Atlanteans that the Brine had were the large magma catapults. Deadly, but slow and easy to avoid. Also, the Brine seemed to be standing on unstable ground with many lava fissures. A massive bombardment might further upset the sea floor, engulfing the entire Brine army in molten lava. But for some reason, both sides don't really open fire until they're directly on top of each other. Not a real good idea, but that's the problem with monarchies. Way too much battle tradition and honor. We humans might be less advanced than the Atlanteans, but we're a lot dirtier when it comes to fighting. So we wouldn't just go up to the crabs and try to fight them in a melee battle. We would probably deep border horizon them. But there is a problem with the ranged weapons being used by these factions. While the Atlantean plasma energy rifles or the brine magma based projectiles really look cool, they seem more like weapons designed for the surface world rather than underwater. For one, energy plasma bolts would quickly dissipate underwater because of water's heat conducting abilities. The magma catapult thing that the brine used is cool, but catapults don't really have enough energy to launch projectiles underwater. Even surface dwelling humans understand that different weapons need to be used for underwater combat. Firearms, for instance, even with their immense power, don't really work underwater. That's because projectiles not designed to travel underwater will face a lot of drag, which will immediately slow the bullet down. This is why military forces use specially designed firearms that fire flayshit rounds or spear guns. These projectiles are better at cutting through liquids. A much better alternative to energy weapons and projectiles would actually be explosives underwater. While the concussive force of an explosion is quite dangerous already in the air, our atmosphere actually will compress and absorb the energy from an explosion. Water, however, is much more difficult to compress. You can take oxygen and compress it in a dive tank, but say you're going on a long hike and you only have a one liter water bottle, but you want to bring one gallon of water along, it's basically impossible to do. This means when something explodes underwater, the pressure from the shockwave is not absorbed by the water. Instead, water transmits the shockwave to a much longer range. So even if you are very far away from an underwater explosion, the shockwave will still hit you as if you were standing much closer to above water explosion. 
This is why death charges and concussion grenades will screw up your day underwater, especially for a crustacean, which basically is a tin can with soft meat in it. A shock wave would just bounce back and forth inside their shell until they're leaking goo out of their orifices. It should be noted, however, that shrapnel is a projectile and would not work that well underwater. It should, however, be noted that shrapnel from these explosions wouldn't be as effective because they are projectiles. But generally speaking, underwater combat because of the medium would have to be fought at closer ranges with melee weapons and special projectiles designed for weapons or just a lot of explosions. And well, explosions and close melee weapons don't really work all that well together and would create massive casualties. Although I guess you could design some kind of shield that can protect you from shockwaves. The Atlanteans certainly would have the technology to design it. So that's basically what I would do. I would equip a bunch of Asgardian Grenadiers with some shields and just use them to destroy everything in their path. Uh, there's also the other factor that Orm is not just looking to defeat the Brine, but also win their respect and eventually the allegiance of their armies. The Brine were a very stubborn species and basically only understood brute force. Orm knew he had to defeat the Brine King in a one-on-one -on -one battle, which is probably why he rushes in on Atlantean cavalry, which consists of giant sea animals. While visually these giant sharks, mosasauruses, and seahorses look pretty cool as mounts, they were actually quite unpredictable and vulnerable machines of war. Clearly, Atlantean warships and war chariots were able to operate quite well and were extremely effective when compared to these animals. They also were easier to control and generally offered the rider more protection. And when Aquaman finally arrives to the scene with Atlan's trident, he was able to control a good portion of the Atlantean mounts, causing confusion in their ranks. By the way, every time you see a massive group beaching by whales, it's not because they're depressed about the environment or something like that. It's much more likely that a bunch of crab people killed them in a Lord of the Rings style epic melee battle. We don't really get this because while all this crazy stuff is going on underwater, all we see is this on the surface. The ocean is terrifying. And the best way to protect us from these terrifying beasts of the deep is by eating them. So join us on our new channel called Generation Yum, where we go on food and motorcycle adventures all around the world. Channel's still a work in progress, and we haven't uploaded any videos yet, but they're coming soon, so please do subscribe. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. My name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie, and you are the protagonist.